I have no interest in providing a machine that makes a bodybuilder's arm go from 20 to 21 interest, inches. That doesn't interest me. But what interests me is people's quality of life and their health uh, being enhanced and being mobile and active and fit. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. A guest today is known as the godfather of strength equipment. In his early 20s, he sold Eagle Fitness, a company he started with his brother four years previously to Cybex, ending the Nautilus dominance of the fitness industry. He then stayed on with Cybex as head of product development and introduced the VR and VR2 lines. And under his leadership, the company launched more than 100 new strength and cardio products. Then in 1999, he broke new ground again with a line of cable-based weight stack machines designed by his own company, Ground Zero Designs, that made it possible to train in multiple planes, eventually selling to Icon. Since then, he's gone on to design for other major equipment brands, including Resolute and Aleco. There's no one that can't benefit from strength training. My whole life has just been making stuff. It's nice to make stuff that looks nice, but really the, the reason for the machine is to elicit a physiological response. Right now, dumbbells and free weights are more popular or as popular as they ever have been, and I think that's an awesome thing. So please welcome this week's guest, Mr. Roy Simonson, to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Mr. Roy Simonson, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. It's, uh, I shouldn't say this because I never have favorites, but it's, it's a subject that, that um, I, it was a pleasure to research. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I think I could talk hours <laughs> okay. about fitness equipment, but um, yeah. I, I kind of, I was, comp I'm, I'm, I like music and I like fitness. And, and I, was, too. I was thinking about Quincy Jones. I don't okay. know if you know Quincy Jones. And, sure do. And, there was, and I kind of thought, of, I was gonna describe you as kind of like the Quincy Jones of fitness equipment. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good or a bad. <laughs> well, Quincy's a big deal, so it's, a, it's I take it as a compliment. I, I think you're a big deal, but you're very, very. From what I'm seeing, I, did, I was trying to do some research, and you're certainly not a self promoter. No, <laughs> that, no. Was, I kind of like just staying in the background, being anonymous. Yeah, and 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 so I, a, a mutual friend of ours, Hillis Lake, yep. um, made the introduction. Mm -hmm. which is great. And, um, and so I, I, I kind of gave up trying to Google and nothing on social media. So I, I went to Hillis to, to assist with some, um, some background information and some secrets and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hillis probably knows as much as anybody. So that was a good source. Right. I, I thought I'd start with, um, with technology. And, and yeah. I, I, now what I do know is you kind of define yourself as a tech idiot. Is that, is oh, that... <laughs> completely. My, my kids just think I'm the dumbest man on earth. I just have no, I can't, I can't see it. It's electricity and it's just, my brain doesn't function the way technology works. No. It just doesn't. And I'm okay with it. I, I know I'm behind the curve and a dinosaur, but that's just the way it is. How do you see where the fitness industry is now? Because I, I suppose everything, more and more products now, even basic ones, that there's, a, there's a push to connect everything. And, yep. and so, so how, how do, as, as, as someone that's sort of invented so many amazing, literally hundreds of products, how, how, do, you, how do you sort of balance what you have, have done as, as an art and a craft and, and sort of where the industry goes? How, how do you see well, I'm kind of like the last guy that does what I do. <laughs> and so I realize there's kind of no one following behind me. But uh, I, I'm not anti-technology. I'm just saying I'm terrible at it. And you know, technology w was first, I think, most appropriate in the cardio products. You know, quite obviously, you're, you're doing something that's inherently kind of boring. And you know, having some technology there to give you some feedback, that, that's an asset. And the first technology for kind of strength equipment was maybe like Fit Links or some of the others mm -hmm. that were just counting reps and that kind of thing. And I, 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 I didn't see it as a negative, but I didn't see it as a real positive, you know, just counting reps and that. Uh, and so, you know, the, we've tried to integrate technology into some strength products. And, you know, now there's some very sophisticated things, you know, some of the products that, you know, measure you know, the, the travel and the speed of bars and so on and force plates and all that kind of stuff. And I think all that stuff is cool. I, I, I think that's very cool. I just, again, I just don't understand it and I don't think I can really contribute to it. But I think it's very cool. But still at the end of the day, for strength training equipment, to me it's still a matter of, you know, train hard, rest hard, uh, train smart, and 
you know, that's going to get you a long ways. I don't know that technology helps you do perform those tasks any better. Mm. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I thought I thought a good an interesting place to start, and it, and it and it doesn't directly link into your story, but you're probably one of the few people that has a perspective on, on this story. Is is from what I understood, one of your companies sort of was very successful at displacing Nautilus, Nautilus's dominance in, in the fitness industry and you know back in the sort of late seventies from if my if my sort of research is correct. And yeah. and I, I I see some old videos of Arthur Jones and yep. some of the stuff they've done and, and you hear these kind of industry stories about it. But when you came in and when, you know when you were a sort of you know young guy developing fitness equipment, what was Nautilus then, what, what do you think they did that was fairly unique? And, and um, I suppose if you had to take everybody back to your way of telling the story of Nautilus, you know, how, how would you kind of explain those days and, and, and why, they, you know, why they were able to do what they did? Well, I thought Arthur was an absolutely brilliant marketeer. He was just the ultimate salesperson, pitch man, you know, he's a larger than life personality, you know, just outrageous, boisterous, you know, all the young wives and the crocodiles and the airplanes and everything. He was just, you know, he was extraordinarily colorful and, you know, he was just an incredible self-promoter. Um, what he did though was he brought strength training kind of to the masses in a palatable, easy to understand and a, and a form that made sense, you know, prior to Prior to Arthur, you know, high schools and colleges, they were having, uh, you know, the old universal gyms and Marcy's, you know, the old inch and a half square chrome tube multi-station machines. But they were pretty rudimentary, pretty rough. And Arthur, uh, you know, with his, he, I don't know if he did or didn't, was, I don't know if he was or wasn't the first guy to u utilize a cam, you know, a variable resistance. And, uh, you know, his, his machines had three common denominators that still hold true today. They're fixed movements. You know, you had a movement arm that moved. So it was fixed, you were stabilized, you know, you were in a chair or, you know, a, a bench and some, and then you were isolated. You were isolating a muscle, a bicep, a, a chest, quadriceps. So these fixed, stabilized, isolated machines, and typically with a cam that gave you a variable resistance, that was totally unique. No one had ever done that before. Okay, so he not only took those machines, he, he brought a training program with it. Way, way back in the day for the clubs, you know, not for athletics and so on, but for clubs, it was very common where it was like Monday, Wednesday, Friday for men, Tuesday, Thursday for the ladies, the weekends were for everybody. <laughs> But you go in there, one circuit, one set to failure, you know, eight to 12 reps, two count, four count. You learned how to do that and you were set, it was done. Well, it was not only a smart marketing thing, it was really, it was great for the machines because it was real easy on the machines, you know, and the chains required a lot of maintenance and right. they were noisy and, you know, wasn't the best choice, but at the time it was a good choice. So, you know, it kind of protected the machines, it got you in and out of the club, you could understand, you know, anybody that works 10 or 12 repetitions on a two count, four count, you know, 60 plus seconds of slow deliberate exercise, you're gonna get a lot of local muscle fatigue. So, you know, at the end of the set, you're, whatever you're working is on fire. And so if it's on fire, it must be doing something good, you know, that's what you're gonna think. And, you know, you are gonna get some results. So everything he did, just opened up a whole new era. And for a number of years, he was just totally unchallenged. Then there were a few little guys starting to come out. There was, you know, um, Paramount and, and Marcy started doing single stations and Hogan and, you know, a bunch of just little, more, more than anything, kind of regional. And there was a few Southern California companies, but their machines were not very good. Arthur's machines were they were good machines. I mean, they were well engineered and well designed. What about the biomechanics on them? Really? Um, they're pretty good, but uh, I, I won't say they were bad, but they were designed for large male strength athletes. Mm. And they didn't really have much adjustability. And if you fit them, it worked okay. His cam profiles uh, were kind of unusual. He, one of his thoughts, at least like on a leg extension, was you're kind of weakest at the end range, so let's accentuate the load at the end. And my way of thinking, that's kind of reverse how, you know, biomechanically your, your body functioned. And so 
you know, you can, there's no hard and fast rules, but I thought some of his resistance profiles and some of his machines could be improved upon, and so I saw an opportunity. <laughs> Did you know Arthur at all? No, I, uh, no, I just heard stories. I, I, I had two interactions with him in my entire life. One was that a, uh, uh, there was a Wally Boyko show, mm -hmm. and uh, Arthur was going to speak, and I was pretty excited. I thought that was kind of cool. I'd like to see what the guy really has to say. And this was when he was starting to do all of his studios with video discs and everything. Right. He talked for 40 minutes just on the future of video discs and libraries were going to be extinct, newspapers are going to go away. He owned all the uh, cameras and, you know, he just made a, he just sounded like he was going to be the Steve Jobs of uh, video discs and that. I just thought that was pretty bizarre, you know, presentation for a fitness industry. And the second one, it's not real flattering, but uh, for Arthur at least, uh, was at a, a, a trade show and I opened the elevator opened and Dick Butkus and uh, Arthur were on the elevator. And first thing I noticed is it just stunk like cigarettes. Uh, Arthur was a chronic chain smoker, <laughs> you know, like packs per day. And Dick Butkus was doing a few promotions for him. And I got on and, you know, Dick Butkus, to me that was a big deal because, you know, I was a football fan and Chicago Bears, Minnesota Vikings, I lived in Minnesota at the time. So I was just kind of silent, you know, by these two kind of larger than life characters. And the door, we went a couple flights, no words were spoken, the door opened, and Arthur said to Dick Butkus, just order me, he goes, go get me a fucking hamburger. And Dick Butkus got out of the elevator and went and got Arthur an elevator, uh, a hamburger. We went up another couple flights, I got out and Arthur stayed on the, Arthur stayed on the elevator. But that, you know, he was kind of, in his gruff way, ordering Dick Butkus around, I thought that was pretty bizarre. Yeah. I suppose in some ways he was, you know, if, if you, even if you think about what's going on now, you know, like the, you know, he, he his marketing methods, I see some of the videos that he, that he did. They're and... more popular now than they've been for a number of years. I see a lot of them. And, you know, whether it's he and Casey Vieter or Mike Menser and so on. But who, was the, who was the lady? Was that his wife um, that he did a lot of the videos with? Uh, yeah. Uh, Terry, yeah, Terry Jones. Right. She was number four, number five, wife number four, number five. Oh, really? Yeah, I think he was married five times. <laughs> and he, he claimed that all of them were like under 20 or something yeah. outrageous. They, they, yeah, yeah she, she was, Terry was a She was a smart lady. She uh, got, a, I believe, and this is through friends, I, I've never met her, but she's apparently a very smart lady. She had a private pli pilot's license and was active in the, in the business and so on, and I don't know what ever happened to her, but uh, she was more than just a pretty face. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. What were the trends going on at the time? Was, was that the era of, was, was that the early era of a lot of the bodybuilding stuff or, or, or did, did that, those machines come before that all kicked off? They kind of coincided. Uh, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't uh, Arnold's reign of consecutive Olympias from 70 to 75, something like that? I, I wouldn't. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was is then, and then he came back seventy eight or nine oh, or eighty for the right. for the next one. Well, Arthur, I believe, kicked his kind of business off officially like in seventy seventy one something like that. So the two of them kind of coincided, and between Arthur and Arnold both being larger than life characters, it opened up a whole new world to the US population. And um, there was also the time around 1970, 
running became kind of a, a big uh, thing. You know, marathons and 10Ks started taking off. Um, more people were riding bicycles, and and uh, I think people were just a little bit more aware of of health at that time. So, I think that Arnold's influence and Arthur's influence massive. I mean, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those two guys. No, no. It's funny you mentioned cardio. I actually saw a video, and it was on. It came up on social media just a couple of days ago with Arthur talking about. I posted it actually. It was talking about how cardio, you know, forget cardio, strength training is what you need. And, it, and it's quite funny because if you go back all those years, mm -hmm. the industry is in a very similar, the reason I posted it was because it was so relevant because there's this, you know, you kind of have these swings, yep. pendulum swings in the industry and there was a lot of cardio and then hit training and stuff. But it, it, kind of what he said was very relevant is look, you know, particularly as you get older, strength training is extremely important. And, um, and I, I suppose, you know, it's almost like we've just relearned some of these things again yeah. <laughs> after all those years. I agree completely. I am a big, big, big fan of maintaining strength training right till you're in the dirt. I mean, just there's no one that can't benefit from strength training. And uh, it's just, there's zero studies to refute that. I mean, there's countless, just countless studies to talk about the importance of strength training. And I'm, I'm not, I have no interest in providing a machine that makes a bodybuilder's arm go from 20 to 21 inches. inches. That doesn't interest me. But what interests me is people's quality of life and their health uh, being enhanced and being mobile and active and fit. And, um, you know, I can't tell you how many people my age. How old are you, by the way? I'm 70. Wow. And I, I just can't tell you how many people my age just can't enjoy the things in life that they really should be enjoying. You know, they're retired and... You know, whether it's playing with grandkids or being able to do the physical activities or what, they're just, uh, you know, and everybody's going to age, but, you know, you want to delay it as much as possible and you want to minimize the decline because everybody's going to decline, but rather than dropping off the edge of a cliff, you know, just, you know, just slowly taper. We're all going to, we're all going to lose strength and fitness and muscle mass and so on, but minimize that decline and, uh, live a long, healthy life. It seems, when you mention the research, it seems as time goes on, more and more very good research is supporting that, even, yes. even like uh, very recently. And um, yeah, I, 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 would, I would totally agree, agree with what you're saying there. So you were involved like in the later 70s. So what was the, um, what was the inspiration for you to get involved in making resistance? Did, did the Nautilus story set, trigger something in your mind or was there some other way that you, you came into it? Uh, kind of another way I came into it. Um, kind of a long roundabout answer, but if we got, yeah, if, we got if you're willing to bear yeah. with it, yeah. Um, in the 60s, uh, everybody got a Sears catalog in the mail. And in the Sears catalog, they always had a 110 pound weight set. And Bruce Randall was the guy that, uh, former bodybuilder and lifter, you could buy the 110 pound plastic, you know, cement weight, weight set for $19.95. <laughs> so I was a skinny 14 year old kid and I bought a set. And I was just weak as a kitten, but I still bought one and uh, started just kind of futzing around with it. I grew up in Minnesota and I was a hockey player and uh, I just started fussing around with weights, and I think I was probably 16, maybe, and uh, I built a bench out of two by fours and uh, you know plywood and hockey sticks and so on, and started making a few for some friends and so on. So it kind of piqued my interest. And my, my sense for making stuff, that, that's kind of what I do. I've just kind of made stuff my whole life. And, uh, I was the first gen, I, I played hockey, like I mentioned, I was the first generation of goalies to wear face masks. And so in eighth grade, I needed a face mask. You know, prior to that, you're just bare faced. And um, so I made, I, you didn't know where to go to get one. So I just figured I'd make one. So I started making face masks. Uh, by the time I was a senior in high school, I was making them for high schools, colleges, and the pros. And, um, so I just kind of always figured if there was something I needed, I could just do it myself, mm -hmm. not knowing any better. You know, it was just ignorance is bliss. 
<laughs> so I just figured I'd start doing it. And uh, I had a knee surgery when I was 17. And uh, meniscus and, you know, nothing serious. But actually, just by chance, the Minnesota Vikings doctor did the surgery. And for physical therapy, he sent me to Fred Zamberletti, who was the Minnesota Vikings trainer. And I was the last... My first visit, I was the last patient on a Friday, and he started asking me, you know, hey kid, why do you do this and that? And I said, oh, you know, just graduating, and um, so what, what are you gonna do next? And I said, I don't, I, you know, I was just another aimless 17-year-old. And he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I do this and that, and I make fiberglass face masks. And he started asking me a couple of questions. He says, are you in a hurry to get home? And I thought, that's an odd question. Mm -hmm. And he says, he says, you know who I am? I said, yeah, you're Fred, you're the trainer. He goes, you, you interested in doing some stuff for the Vikings? And I thought, that's, <laughs> yeah, sure. So we drove to uh, the Minnesota, it was during the off season. It was actually about this time of year. We drove to the Minnesota Vikings uh, training facility and went down into the training room. And he showed me these very rudimentary protective pads that they were uh, using on guys when they had an injury and an artificial limb company was making them for them. And he said, could you do this? And you know, I said, yeah, sure. And so once the season started, I started making stuff for the Vikings. You know, they take like a contusion to the thigh or, you know, you know, something to the forearm or the bicep. And so I'd, I'd go in on a Monday after once the season, during preseason, I kind of got my feet wet and they realized I could do this. So once the season started, like on a Monday, I'd go in and I'd make a plaster bandage cast of the in injury and I'd make a protective pad for him and I'd, and a fiberglass, and I'd bring it back on Tuesday and I'd make more money in a day than my friends working at National Can Company or the window manufacturing company would make in two weeks. And I thought, you know, I don't need to get a job, I can just do this. So I did that for a while. And uh, then I started fussing with a few more. I, I bought one of those $110 uh, stick welders, and I just started stick welding some rusty steel together. And then I had another set of knee surgeries, both knees. And for rehab, I just start. I just I started doing my own rehab, and uh, they were having me do stiff-legged leg lifts and stuff that I just thought was it wasn't. It wasn't the thing to do. <laughs> so I, I, very, I still remember this very distinctly. The, my first workout was I went in front of a lat pull machine. I grabbed the bar and pulled it down. And I set it, I weighed about 190 at the time. So I set it to like 160 or 70. So I was doing like a 30 pound squat, you know, a de-weighted squat. So the first workout was like with 150. The next workout was 130. You know, after like two weeks, I could squat my body weight. And after uh, you know a couple months, I was at a few hundred pounds and that. So I just knew that strength training and I could do some stuff there. Then I started building racing bicycles because I started riding my bike a lot. I started racing my bike, and um, which I did right up. Well, I, I probably bicycle race on the velodrome, you know, the, right, yeah. the indoor tracks. I did that for about 40 years. Um, so then I started making racing bicycles, and I made bikes, I don't know, a few hundred, but I made them for the French Olympic team and, and some others. And so my whole life has just been making stuff. And so to get, so it was like 77, 78, my brother who's 78, my brother is four years younger than me. And he was playing football at a, a D3 school in Minnesota. And they were going to outfit their weight room. And he said to the coach, hey, my brother could probably do, because the stuff was so rough back then. And he said, my brother could outfit the room. And so the, the football coach, the head coach, he just didn't know any better. And he said, yeah, you know, just outfit the room. So I spent a couple months just making, you know, just again, benches and inclined benches and just basic stuff. And I thought, hell, there might be a real job here. <laughs> and so about a year later, my brother was going to graduate uh, from college and I was going to school part time. I, I'm a terrible student. So my brother and I, even though he's four years younger, we were both going to graduate at the same time. 
And we were watching the Super Bowl in 79, and uh, the conversation was just like, hey, what are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. And so the question was, let's just start a business. And so we just said, let's just start a weightlifting business. And it was just as simple as that. We just didn't know any better. We were too dumb to know that you needed to know a lot more than we knew. <laughs> but we just did it. And, and what, was the, what was the, the sort of first kind of piece that you did then that you remember? And uh, what was it called? Was it called Eagle? Yeah, was it, it was Eagle. Where did Eagle you get the, what was the name from? Uh, we just, we couldn't. Yeah, it probably took five minutes. We just couldn't think of a name. We thought, like, well, Eagle, you know. There, uh, Eagle, that sounds good. It was, it was probably that much thought was put into it. Uh, the first couple of pieces we made were free weight benches. And they were actually, uh, even by today's standards, they were pretty decent. And you know, a bench is really kind of a bench. There are some standards that needs to meet and so on. But uh, we did that. And then uh, we, we had no money. I mean, we started the company. Uh, my brother and a friend borrowed $1,000 and with that thousand bucks, we bought another welder, a little portable bandsaw, and uh, I was driving a 62 Chevy. We pulled out the back seat and ripped out the trunk. That became like our truck, and we bought a bunch of steel, and we just started making stuff. And so we made a bunch of benches. My brother was like the business end of the business. Uh, he's, he's very smart. He, uh, he's actually a physician today. So he was the business end of the business. Um, I'd just go back and make the stuff. He would sell it and take care of it. My mom was an accountant or a, a bookkeeper. She would kind of keep the books for us. Um, we met another friend named Joyce Madsen who ended up becoming, running the factory, the Eagle factory for about 15 years. She was 22 at the time. My brother was 22, I was 26. So it was just all these young people that just had an idea and we started doing it. About six months into it, the town that we were in, they had a little racket club, River Falls, Wisconsin Racket Club, and they were gonna buy seven pieces of Nautilus equipment. And my brother went and talked to him and said, listen, uh, we'll do seven pieces for you for $7,000, and they bit. And so we made seven weight stack pieces. We made a chest press, a shoulder press, a bicep, a tricep, a lat, a row, a leg press, and a leg extension. I think that was the pieces. And it took probably three, four months. It was really just me making them. We made our own weight stacks. We, did, we upholstered them ourselves. We just did everything ourselves. And um, we thought, there's something here. Let's give this a shot. We saw the Nautilus machines, um, studied those, saw what we thought you could maybe improve upon or things you could do better. and. That was just the start. That was 79. Uh, and you went on, Cy did, Cy did Cybex put an offer for you? Or how did, what was that? How did that come <clears> That was that? interesting. Uh, at that time, Cybex uh, was really an isokinetic testing device, you know, the isokinetic okay, knee right. machines. Yeah. They also made a, a Fitron, an isokinetic bike, and they uh, had a UBE upper body ergometer. Right, yeah, I remember. And so they were selling a lot of stuff to the physical therapy, in, in physical therapy. And at that time, the reimbursement issue for uh, isokinetic, te isokinetic test was significant. And so the, to buy, if you're a physical therapy clinic and you had isokinetic testing devices, you could get reimbursed very well. Mm. And so that was a hot commodity. So that's then. probably what drove the innovation in that area then, is it? Exactly. Way? Okay. Exactly. And so what was happening was Cybex was going into all these PT clinics and they were seeing that there was these Nautilus machines in there in conjunction with, you know, what they were trying to sell. So they thought, you know, maybe we should be making some of these weight stack machines as well. And they thought, well, let's just do a little search and see if there's a little company that we could buy, you know. And I think this was 83. We had been in business for four years. And uh, three years or four years, 82, 83. And uh, I think 82. And so they looked at a number of companies, and I don't know how they found us, but we just got a, a phone call or somehow that Cybex uh, was interested in uh, speaking with us. And I, I knew Cybex from going into a, PT clinics and, and seeing the products around. 
and uh, they made us an offer. And the business was owned by my brother, myself, and we had a third business partner named Carol Nelson. We took Carol Nelson on about two years after being in business. We were in business two years and we were struggling. I think the first year I made 4,000, the second year I made 4,000 bucks. Both years my brother took zero money because he wasn't working as much and he worked like at the Ford plant at night putting <laughs> trucks together. And so we were just kind of starving to death. And we, we knew we had an idea, but we didn't really know anything about manufacturing. So there was this guy named Carol Nelson who was a friend of a friend. Carol was in the manufacturing business. He was making uh, brush cutters and uh, heavy industrial equipment. Well, he said we had a few discussions with him, and he thought we had an idea. And Carol was an awesome guy, awesome guy. Self-made, self-made, multimillionaire, was 20 years old, had an eighth grade. When he was 20 years old, he had an eighth grade education and four kids. And when we met him, he was probably 50, and he had bought and sold very, very, bought and sold four very successful businesses. So Carol was the right guy to be cooked mm. up with, and just an awesome guy, super honest. So he's, Carol said to us, tell you what, move to Owatonna, Minnesota. That's an hour south of the Twin Cities, and it's where the Cybex slash Life Fitness facility still is today. And he said, come into this little town, and uh, I'll set you up. I, can, I know the bankers in town. I, we can find a building and so on, and I'll be a third equal partner. He invested some money. The first thing he did was he said, you guys need a regular salary. We got $1,500 a month. We just thought we were rich. We were so rich. <laughs> first thing I did, I went out and bought a microwave and a boom box. I, just, I felt yeah. I was rich. Essentials. And, yeah, I, I just couldn't have been happier. So uh, when Cybex came and talked to us, uh, Carol said, listen, I think this is the right thing. These, so what uh, we did is we sold the business to Cybex in exchange for Lumex stock. And Lumex at the time was the parent company of Cybex. Mm. Lumex Inc. was a medical, uh, they made geriatric patient aids, you know, like uh, walkers and canes and just, you know, stuff that you'd find uh, in, I don't even know what they're referred to today, but uh, they're, they're a manufacturer of like hospital beds and that kind of stuff. Cybex was a subdivision, and so we got a bunch of Lumex stock in exchange. That was, at the time, I think the three of us got a total of like, 2.1 or 2.3 million dollars worth of Lumex oh. stock. So was that? That sounds like it was a lot of money at the time. It was a huge amount of money. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was rich making 18, you know, 1,500 bucks a month, and so suddenly, you know, this dumb kid from Minnesota gets, you know, 700 thousand dollars worth of stock. I, I was pretty fired up. Mm. So uh, Cybex took over. Uh, Dave Hillary was the president. Treated us extraordinarily well. It was, it was a very nice relationship. So we, in a very short period of time, we built a lot of stuff real fast. We started out in a 7,000 square foot building. Within a year, we were at like 15,000 square foot building. Within a couple years, we were in 100, 100 or 120,000 square feet. Uh, Number of years ago, it went to 300. Now it's like 400 and some thousand square feet. Okay, so they acquired us in like 82. Uh, my brother was the president. Joyce, the woman I mentioned before, she was uh, uh, the CFO. And I don't even know what role my job title was, but I was just the guy making the products. And uh, they acquired us in 82 by the Summer, by the spring of 84, we had a, about a 20-piece weight stack line. We had a full line of plate loaded. We had a full line of weight stack. And I said, what do you guys want me to make next? I got lots of ideas. And they said, well, nothing. And I said, well, you must want something. They said, no, why don't you just be the welding foreman or something? I said, I, I, no. <laughs> and they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to keep making stuff. And they said, there really isn't anything to make. And they said, I said, OK, well. I guess this is my, the end of my tenure with the company. And so they gave me, uh, you know, they gave me a, 
I don't know what the severance package was, but it was, it was, it was more than I would have expected. Mm. So I was very happy, but I had a five-year non-compete. Did you keep your, did you sell your shares in the um, other company? No, I, I kept the Lumex shares. Right. And because I'm, okay, I'm a, I'm a good guy to start a business, I'm the wrong guy to run a business, and part of running a business is being smart with your money. And I just, that's just not me. So I gave all my money to some investment people that in five years pretty much went through all of it. Uh -huh. There was Drexel Burnham Lambert that was a trading company out of New York City. And I think they, in 89, they got shut down and I had all my money in them. And I invested four condos in Hawaii <laughs> on this guy's advice and that was a scam and so on. So, so when my non-compete ran out, I kind of had zero money. I lived in Jackson. Okay. Uh, when... In 84, when they said, you don't need anything, I thought, oh, I'm just going to go live in the mountains. That sounds like fun. So I moved to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and lived there up in the mountains. And it was pretty awesome. And, uh, uh, but at the end of five years, I was kind of out of money. Or six years, kind of out of money. So I needed a job again. So uh, I called up Cybex and said, are you interested in anything I might have to offer? And they said, no, they, they really weren't. <laughs> So I said, okay. And at that time, they had a competitor in Davis, California called Loradan. And uh, Loradan was making isokinetic testing devices. So uh, I called them up and said, uh, would you be interested in you know, perhaps having some strength equipment? And it was a husband and wife that uh, founded the company and they were backed by VC people, but they were managing the company. They said, sure. So I went to work for them for next to no money, but I thought if I could just get my foot in the door. Mm. And, and so I made a line of equipment for those guys called Lido, and it was very unique. Um, here is the premise. With weight stack machines, you lift, again, they're fixed stabilized isolated machines. Um, with weight stack machines, you lift a variable amount of weight, a fixed distance. So you're lifting foot pounds. The inverse, which I did with that line, was everybody lifted the whole weight stack. It was one weight pack, but you lifted a variable distance. Mm. So it was foot pounds again. But what I did was I had a lever arm that moved and you had 100 levels of incrementation. And so if you had a 200 pound weight stack, you had 200 pound increments. And because at the lighter weights, the weight just barely moved, you could high speed train because you weren't getting that inertial effect. And uh, you know, that's a, a weight stack moving, that's a squared factor. So if it moves half as, you know, it's a, it, it's a four times thing. So if you're only moving at one inch and you normally move at 12 inches, you in essence have zero inertia. So you can high speed train mm. with these machines. That's where I met Hillis Lake. I met Mike Tracy, who's been a friend of mine also, who's been in the industry for years. Uh, we were doing really well. What and, happened to that range, by the way? Is that still around? Well, he, here's the interesting part. And uh, uh, isokinetics at that point were starting to lose, not popularity, but the government was cutting back on the reimbursements you were getting. Rather than getting $200 for a test, you'd get $50 or $25. All of a sudden, no one wanted isokinetic machines anymore. So. They were struggling a little bit, but our business was going pretty good. The, the, the venture capital guys thought that we were doing good and they should take the company public. And they fired the founder and his wife and put their people in place. And six months later, we were out of business. <laughs> so as our, we were out of business. So Hillis and myself, we... We're looking for a job. Did that, does any of that stuff exist anymore? Does yeah, there's just... still a few places. I think right. there's still a tennis club up. We sold several dozen circuits, or I don't know how many circuits, but does the is the idea still like a valid one oh, today? Oh, hundred percent. I've made never... I've made several iterations over the years that yeah. have just been in my shop, just waiting to see the light of day. Yeah. But yeah, they, they worked awesome. They're awesome machines. I, I just want to go back, just just pause for a second, just just back to the Cybex, because because there was yeah. a few key things that that happened when you were Cybex. So there was the um, there was the plate load, which I guess what what came first, Cybex or Hammer Strength? Well, Hammer. 
I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, Nautilus pre preceded everything. Really? I didn't know they did plate load. Um, in the early 80s, Nautilus had a line of machines that were virtually identical to hammer machines. Mm. If you look through some of the old archives, you can see some of them. If you talk to Hillis, because Hillis <laughs> used to be involved with Nautilus way back in the day. And for, I think, I may have this wrong, and I know Gary Jones, and you know, Gary's a smart guy. And I think, they, I don't know how many they had, but I know Gary took those machines in the mid 80s, something like that. And what those were, were, uh, he got a group together. I think there was like seven people. There was um, Nick Orlando and, and a few other folks. I, I believe there was like six or seven guys that all kind of were former Nautilus guys that got involved with the hammer formation. And the, the thing that they did, which was very clever and very unique for the time and still is those machines of the... 1990 are still the same machines being sold today. But they were independent arms and converging or diverging patterns. People hadn't done that before, so that was very unique. But those were originally a Nautilus design. Mm. The, and, and Gary was Arthur's son? Yes. Okay. And, and Gary was perhaps the very first guy to bring um, computer-aided design, CAD design, and I, they might have been Hewlett Packard, I'm not sure, but he had a deal where, with, if it was them, for example, where they were, he was like working in conjunction with them, I believe, designing software and so on. By today's standards, it was pretty basic, you know, like Pac-Man almost, <laughs> but, but Gary was really into that, and he was a computer designer. He designed equipment on the computer. And, Gary did a lot of things really smart. You know, he made them very manufacturable. He told me that, you know, all the bill of materials for all the machines could just be on a single sheet of paper. You know, he standardized a lot of things. He made them all break down so they could fit easily through the paint line. Um, they're easily fixtured and so on. Um, very intelligent machines, and they, they're still, when you think plate loader, you think hammer. Mm. I mean, they, they've done a really good job. Mm. So the Cybex kind of, that, that, that followed the Nautilus and hammer strength or what, what was the period? Because I remember when, I remember when the, the plate load came out from Cybex because they, they also had, was there a regular plate load and then the VR2? Yes. Okay. Okay, now I did, okay, in the mid 80s and the time that I was gone, uh, there was a guy named Tarl Coley, Carl Tolley, excuse me, that was an engineer there. And Carl is the guy that had invented the power blocks, the Intel bells. Mm. Brilliant design. I just, I, it was one of those things where I wish I'd thought of that. I just think Carl just knocked it out of the park. Carl did a line uh, that was called Modular, and they had some shrouding, and he did a few plate-loaded pieces and so on. But when I went back to Cybex in like 92, I believe, um, that's when, okay, I went back in 92, a guy named Steve Williams, uh, who became a very good friend of mine, he convinced Cybex that they should hire me, even though a few years earlier they didn't want to. And so I was actually hired just to do a couple home pieces. And I did those, and then I just said, you know, that original Eagle line that I made, you know, starting like the 1980s, getting kind of long in the tooth. Uh, and I think there's a whole lot of stuff we can do. So, so I, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, just leave me alone for a little bit, let me make some stuff. And so I made two or three prototypes of a, a line that was called VR. And I made two or three prototypes of a line that became VR2. And I said, which one do you want to do? And they brought in some, which they had never done before, they brought in 15 or 20 customers and we decided we actually wanted to do both. And so, did the VR line, did the VR2 line, did all the plate loaded line, and did the weight stack line. And I did that with, uh, we set up a shop in Colorado Springs. The, the factory was in Owatonna, Minnesota. And I, from Minnesota, and I'm glad I was born and raised there, but I didn't want to live there anymore. And so I said, I want to live in the mountains again. So it, I set up a shop in Colorado Springs, and that we, there was myself, one 
one, sometimes two engineers, and two to three fabricators. And in a less than a two-year period, we made the VR line, which was somewhere around 15 pieces. We did the VR2 line, somewhere around 20. We did a dozen or 15 plate loaded. We did a dozen or 15 free weight pieces. We made the we made a thing called the hiker, which subsequently morphed into the uh, arc trainer. And we did all that in about a two year time period, just because we just didn't have any outside noise or interfer in any interference. So what we'd do is we'd get, we'd get like two or three machines done in Colorado Springs, and then we'd get three people from the factory in Minnesota to come out. Three really talented guys that are still friends and I hold in high regard. Product manager, Greg Highsmith. Oh, Greg. <laughs> still the best guy in the industry. Second guy was Steve Went, who was an actual mechanical engineer. Really good. Rick Bartholomew, manufacturing engineer. I hired Rick in like, he was maybe like employee number four or something like that. Those guys would come out in one hour's time. We'd kind of go over what the machines needed to be. We could weigh it, count the number of inches of weld. We would never be off on more, by more than 5% of what the cost of goods would be. So I would, the machines would be 95% done. Greg would ensure from a product management standpoint that they were what we intended them to be, you know, what points in space were critical, what things weren't. Rick Bartholomew would make sure they were manufacturable. You know, there was, uh, you know, if there was some commonality or just some things that we could tweak a little bit. And Steve Went was the engineer who made sure all, everything was done correctly. That was just an awesome team. We just, we just killed it at that point. We were just, that was really the heyday of Cybex during those middle 90s. That was really a fun time. When you were developing those items, were you looking out at what trends were happening in the marketplace, or was this something that you thought, look, this, this is what we've done, this is what the industry needs, and you were hoping that the sales team, people like Hillis and that, were going to take this out and change people's minds? Where, what, what was the driver in, in that? Um, more the latter. Um, in the early 80s, uh, everybody was making Nautilus clones. By the late 80s, I think we, we at Cybex, I was no longer there, but maybe like by 1990, I think there was a larger installed base of Cybex equipment than Nautilus. And so by the early 90s, there was starting to be some Cybex clones. And that was one of the reasons why I said, you know, it's getting kind of long in the tooth. We need to, you know, upgrade and so on. And, you know, during that time, I was still always active in, I've always weight trained in some fashion and kind of stayed somewhat connected to the industry. And I just saw lots of things that could be done and improved upon and so on. And so, uh, you know, I always, you know, to this day, I talk to Hillis once a week, and you know, I talk to other sales guys, and I like to go visit clubs and, and see what's going on. So it was mostly just uh, just observing, and you know, just things that evolve, whether it's cars or music or equipment or mountain bikes or anything. You know, just things that evolve, and if you're paying attention and you've got a little creativity, hopefully you can stick in the game. Coming up next. My single biggest criticism of our industry is just the lack of good education. There's no real leaders or market uh, leaders. There's people that sell a lot of stuff. You know, Matrix sells a lot of stuff. Technogym sells a lot of stuff. But what have they really created that is unique and innovative and, you know, everybody wants to copy? I'm not sure that there is anything there. When in real life are you fixed, stabilized, and isolated? And the answer is you're not. These t-shirt muscles are, are nice and, and so on, but that doesn't necessarily help you live a longer, healthier, productive life. I'd rather try 10 times to do something and fail nine, but knowing that there's a 10th where I'm gonna be able to pull it off. Never afraid of failure, because everybody fails. I had quite a few of the brands nowadays, even many of the products that 
are, are based on a lot of the biomechanics and movements of some of those early Cybex pieces that people are saying today. Would, would you concur with that statement? This, this is going to sound very self-serving, but I think if you close your eyes and you get on any piece of equipment today, I think even someone who's very fluent in you know, the feel and the technology and so on could tell the difference between anything built today and anything built at that time period. And I think that like those VR2 machines, there was, there was a lot of other good machines. It wasn't just VR2. Um, Body Masters made some stuff. Life Fitness was making some stuff. Was that, not, was that the high-tech? High high-tech high was more based on you know, the original uh, Eagle stuff. Right. I've known Phil forever. And uh, yeah. Um, you know, there was Flex, there was Icaria, and there was Paramount, there was a lot of them. But all of those manufacturers' equipment, I mean, if you go into a gym today, they don't have a lot of paint left on them, and they maybe been reupholstered a couple of times, but they're still pretty darn good machines. And really, the, the proof is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's nice to make stuff that looks nice, but really, the, the reason for the machine is to elicit a physiological response. I mean, really, that's, that's it, it's a tool. It's a tool to accomplish something. And if it fits a good cross-section of people, doesn't cause injury, it's comfortable to use, it's easy to adjust when it does need to adjust, if it's tough, durable, safe, you know, all of these things that it needs to have, I don't think that we've moved the ball forward very much in the last 30 years. I think they're prettier. I think they got a lot of plastic on them, <laughs> which I don't think really has a place in a weight room and strength equipment. But they look nice, and I think part of that is because the manufacturers, um, when the cardio products really started coming on strong, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, you know, Stairmasters, Tectrix, uh, Life, obviously, Precor, you know, those all require plastic shrouding and so on. And <clears throat> There's a very nice business model selling cardio equipment. One is it doesn't have an indefinite life like yeah. strength, so you can turn it over. The other thing is you can sell tens of thousands of a unit as opposed to hundreds or thousands. So I understand why all the companies all of a sudden wanted to jump on the cardio bandwagon. But when they all jumped on the cardio bandwagon, we just started making generic, pretty strength products and um, stopped innovating strength. And we've in some ways kind of regressed, which in some ways is good. You know, uh, right now dumbbells and free weights are more popular or as popular as they ever have been, and I think that's an awesome thing. You know, a dumbbell is the least, least sophisticated thing in the weight room, but if you know how to use it, it's one of the most sophisticated tools you can possibly use. So I'm not, you know, things have life cycles and so on. But most of the basic stuff in a weight room strength area is still real basic and hasn't evolved very much. Mm. And I think that's kind of a shame. Mm. Yeah, it does. It, you know, you get on some of the stuff now and it feels like a very cheap car. Some of the things used to feel like you're getting in a, a just a super well-made engineered thing. And, and uh, just, um, like I say, I'm not being necessarily critical, more disappointed that it, it's just... Uh, yeah, build quality, a lot of the stuff's changed uh, very much. You, you well, I, I think what's happened is um, two things. One is, um, back in those days that you're referring to, the buyers were real students of product. Mm -hmm. I remember Mike Feeney and uh, Pat Regan and Brahm, you know, they'd come in and they'd try every piece and they'd pick and choose. And they really were discerning buyers. And today I think many... The club business is hugely successful, and um, they tend to just buy, they're buying such volume, and they're run by business people, not strength aficionados, that to them it's a commodity. And so when you're selling soap or cornflakes or towels and it's, you know, there's no product differentiation, you're going to go for the lowest mm -hmm. cost or the best deal or a kickback or one thing or another. So that's one thing that's happened. The second thing that's happened is the end users now don't know the difference either. Um, my single biggest criticism of our industry is just the lack of good education. There's lots of education out there, but I don't know how you 
you've got to be an educated person yourself to know the difference between good education and bad education. You know, you get on YouTube or, you know, any of the social media sites, there are some good trainers, but there's just a lot more shitty trainers, you know, just people that, you know, if I get on YouTube and as soon as the trainer is a screamer, I just shut them off. Or if they're just dressed outrageously and they got a crazy way, I just shut that off. Or if they claim that, you know, in 30 days you're gonna grow, I just shut them off. And, and that, that gets a lot of eyeballs though. Mm. And I think people don't know what's right or wrong. Uh, you go in the gym, we all go in the gym, and 90% of people that we see just have no clue as to what they do. They're not stupid, they're ignorant. Ignorance is just lack of knowledge. They just don't know what to do. Uh, some of the worst are the people my age, you know, the old guys just, you know, just doing this with too much weight or, and so on. I, I, I see females training much better than men. I think men are much more concerned about their ego and how they, you know, how much weight is on the, on the machine. And women are more concerned about proper technique and form and so on. But I just, I go to the gym, I just see train wrecks just all the time. I think that's, cha I'm, I'm starting to see it changing in pockets where you are, there are some brands, I won't mention them on, on here, but there's, there's some brands that a lot of people probably are not aware of that are, you know, they're focusing on biomechanics, very, very well made and engineered. 100%. And I think now you're starting to see some of the younger demographic that are really into their strength training and, and the people that are building these gyms are actually going back to, right, we want, this is the best leg piece. I was in a gym in Vegas, I did an interview um, with Flex Lewis, yeah. just, and you know, he's done a yeah, leg I know room, what it's yeah. and, and he's picking, he's, you know, he's got a whole, it's about a thousand square feet of just legs, and, he, and he's just gone and got the best different leg pieces in there. And, and so I do see this almost going back to full circle again, you know, back to sort of like the 80s where that was how people used to buy. I'd love to see that happen. Um, there's, in a 10 mile radius of where we are today, I don't know how many hundreds of facilities there are, <laughs> and you could probably count on one hand the number of really well-managed, well-outfitted, educated facilities that are out there that are more than like a, a, just a small boutique kind of mm -hmm. facilities. But the big boxes tend to just, they're warehouses of equipment, mm -hmm. and you're, you're kind of left on your own. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's great equipment, but if you don't know how to do it or how to use it properly, you know, my analogy is it's, it's like, I've told this to a, a, a story to a lot of people. Um, I grew up skating and I, I can ski well and a number of years ago, my kids were all snowboarding and I thought I'm gonna try it. And I thought to myself, I can ski just fine, but I've never snowboarded. I'm not gonna go to the top of the mountain and expect to get to the bottom. So before I started, I took two days of, you know, some coaching, some training and to figure out how to snowboard. But yet, we throw all these tools into a gym and someone walks in for the first time and, you know, they're a bit overwhelmed. You know, should I use that or that? Or how do you adjust it? Or should I do two sets or 10 sets? or what's proper range of motion or what form should I hold? Or, I mean, there's just, there's a lot to, there's a lot to learn. Now, Arthur Jones looks as though he kind of figured that out a long time ago now, but he's, he's, he's a circuit. <laughs> one of his brilliant marketing toys. You, you hop in there, you can do one thing, one step in and out. I mean, it was brilliant. So you, I'll go, I'll go back now to the story sure. that you were telling. So you and Hillis, you finished the other company, they, they, Closed down. Um, kind of pick, let's pick back up again. What what happened that, with Cybex? Uh, you, so you were you were mentioning there was a, there was a company that. Um, so you left Cybex. You went up into the mountains. Yep, Loredan. Yeah. Yep. They brought in some private equity, closed it down. Yep. And you left basically with starting from scratch again. Yeah, that's when I got hired back at Cybex to to do the couple home pieces. Okay, we did the VR, the VR2, all the plate, all the stuff. We were just, just killing it, just killing it. Cybex had two divisions. They, there was still a Lumex, I believe, at that time, you know, that what we called the bedpan division. <laughs> then there was Cybex Medical, and Cybex Medical was the isokinetic. 
And they had not only the knee testing machine, they had a back testing, a flexion extension, they had a rotation. Uh, Cybex was doing a thing they called the bike, a very robust, heavy uh, ergometer, so to speak. But that division was not doing well. The Cybex Medical was, I believe they were losing money. The fitness division, what we were, was doing very well. At that time, we had a few hundred thousand square feet of manufacturing space. We had about 40 sales guys. Uh, we were just doing really well. Um, the board of directors of Cybex or Lumex, whoever it was, decided that Cybex, we were going to spin off all the divisions, and Cybex Fitness was now for sale. We got acquired in 96, 97, somewhere around there, by Trotter. Trotter at the time was uh, about half the size of Cybex. They were a treadmill company, and I believe they had the Pyramid strength line. Um, <clears throat> within, well, this is bottom line. Trotter got 50.001% of the controlling interest in the deal. Within two months, um, 18 of the top 20 positions in the company were Trotter people. I was one of the two left, and I was gone like in two months and a day. It just, the company just, it was gutted. It became Trotter. And when the deal happened, I believe the Cybex stock, or the Lumex stock, the stock was trading at like $14 a share. Um, I don't know how many years ago, but it, it was down to less than a dollar. And um, Cybex never really recovered. During the early 2000s, what kind of kept Cybex afloat was the ARC trainer. That was very profitable. Who did invented that? Well, I did a thing called the hiker, which was the predecessor to it, where the independent steps and move through this. And I had the arms that moved in opposition, and I had them in, in uh, not linked, and you, so you could control your stride length. The engineer at Trotter converted it into like a, a fixed pattern, and he made the same side motion. And I, to this day, think that is. You know, it's not how people move. I mean, you don't right foot, right leg it, you know, you move in opposition. But uh, that engineer did that, and, and because it was different, or they had a lot of marketing about its benefits, which I didn't agree with, but <laughs> it's not me to say. I mean, it's just my opinion. And uh, they sold the crap out of those things. Mm. They sold a lot of ARC trainers. And then uh, they, they... I think uh, they're still selling them a lot. But yeah. Um, I don't know how it's, many they're selling. It's a Life Fitness product now, I think. That was it's a Life thing. Fitness product. And now, and then, I don't know what year it was, but Life Fitness acquired Cybex. And slowly, the Cybex name and brand and importance has been you know, minimized. And today it's, today, it's like non-existent for all practical purposes. It had its it had its heyday and now it's just another casualty, <laughs> another former big name on the on the put out the pasture. How do you feel about that being sort of you know? Well, I think it's kind of a shame. I, I think we had a we had a we had a huge following, and um, you know, one of my motivations is always, and this is just a like a sound bite, but one of my motivations has always been. At Ursa, when the doors open, everybody walks by everybody else just to come to your booth. I mean, to me, that's a sign that you are somebody. You know, they may not even want to buy your product, but they like what you stand for and they respect and trust the sales organization and they know that you're, they know that you're real. And I don't know who is that today. I don't know if there is somebody that's there. I know we had that back in the day. And, uh, you know, there, there's no, there's no, I, I, these are extraordinarily lofty, but just for a comparison, there's no apples in our, 
as manufacturers, or there's no Teslas, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no real leaders or market uh, leaders. There's people that sell a lot of stuff. You know, Matrix sells a lot of stuff. Technogym sells a lot of stuff. But what have they really created that is unique and innovative and you know, everybody wants to copy? I'm not sure that there is anything there. You it's know. difficult, you know, how do you feel about this? Because um, I think there's a fine line between innovating and may maybe, maybe it comes down to having deep pockets to get the message out. But where, where do you see um, the, the fine line before, between bringing something out that's ahead of where people are and, and making it work or kind of doing slight iterations on what's already out. They're almost kind of giving people what they want as opposed to giving things that they've not necessarily thought about. Because if you're too far ahead, you can, and I've, I've seen lots of great examples that are just so far ahead of themselves, they, they almost like collapse before they ever make it. Does, do you think that depends on how well funded you are to get some of those ideas out and convince people or, or, or do you have a different view on it? Well, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it, and it's luck, it's timing, it's funding, it's, uh, okay, for example, there was, uh, just uh, kind of to your point, there was, uh, um, you know, until Chuck Norris and Chris Brink Chrissy Brinkley came along, that total gem had been around for years and years, mm. the minute they endorsed it, and they started doing some good uh, infomercials, um, you know, thing just exploded. Um, remember in the 90s, there was Covert Bailey, who had, was a, a PBS guy, and they had this thing. It was a it was an all-in-one cardio piece. And in one year's time, they sold millions of dollars worth, and it was gone the next day. But they're the right place at the right time, and so on. And as far as the innovation, I think just moving the ball forward step at a time, that's innovative as well. And I, I see that because I'm a cyclist. I see, every year I think, man, that, that's about as good as it can get. And every year it's just a little better. You know, it just keeps moving up. And they kind of revert, they kind of do some stuff that's been tried in the past, but they make it better. And they, the car companies do a good job at that, don't they? Phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, and then there's the just coming out of left field, you know, uh, electric cars, who'd have thought? Mm. Um, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm a technology idiot, but I read Steve Jobs' book not to find out anything about computers, but kind of found out, trying to find out what made the guy tick. And he had a lot of sound bites in there. And I wrote, as I read the book, I just wrote down about 15 of them. And, uh, you know, one of them was the customer doesn't know what they want until we show it to them. Yeah, I, 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 I chew that over quite a lot. Yeah, and, and I think there's an element of truth to that. Um, I don't think you could have showed an iPhone in 1990, but you know when he did show it, it was the right right time to show that. Um, for example, in the early 90s, no one was asking for a cardio piece where your feet would kind of just shuttle along like this. I was in a booth right next to. Our booth was right next to the pre-core booth when that was introduced. And I looked at it, and I had seen a prototype of that years before. And I thought, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, I kind of poo-pooed it. But when I saw it, how they, their iteration of it, I thought it was kind of cool. They sold the crap out of those mm. things. I don't know who was the first person to do the stepper. I know that Stairmaster popularized the, the daylights out of that. And... Stairmaster made steppers like it was Kleenex. You know, a, a stair stepper was a Stairmaster. I mean, it was it was just the, the generic term. Even during the '90s and the 2000s, if I'm someplace, I'm on an airplane or talking to someone and they ask what I do, I say, I do strength stuff. And they say, what do you do? I say, well, I make strength machines. They go, oh, do you do Nautilus? Yeah, Nautilus, you know, for 30 years was still the, the name. So th there's a lot of things. It, it's right place, right time. I mean, it's just life's so random and unpredictable. It's just, it's just hard to say. Mm. So how, how did the, the move to, um, I guess, 
the Ground Zero product, if that was what it was originally called. How, yeah, it was. Uh, where did, where did, was that sort of shortly after the move from Cybex then? Well, when, uh, when the Trotter Cybex, Trotter Cybex merge occurred, you know, I was an early casualty. And uh, uh, I, when I left, I had a 18-month non-compete. So during that time, I just you know, had a lot of time to think. And that was, I guess, the time where one winter I went uh, snowboarding for the first time with my kids. Then I started doing some uh, climbing in the gyms. And for years and years, I had kind of trained not, I wouldn't say conventionally, but I wasn't doing a lot of rotational stuff and so on. So when I'm snowboarding, my body is facing this way and I'm going that way and everything is going on. And you know, I had good quad strength and you know, I was very good in this plane, but I'd come back from snowboarding and I just tore into pieces. And then I started climbing in the rock gym and all these little repositioners and stabilizers and all these little muscles that you need to hold yourself on the wall and so on just getting torn to pieces as well. And I thought, I thought I was kind of fit, but I guess I'm not as fit as I thought I was. And uh, so Juan Carlos Santana, I think you know that mm -hmm. name. Juan was, uh, he was an early proponent of uh, tubing, training with bands and tubing and so on. And uh, one of my buddies, Victor Verhag, V-Man, uh, mm -hmm. He was a sales guy for us at Cybex in the early days. I worked out with him one day and he was showing me all of these crazy tubing things that was going on. And I thought, uh, it's kind of cool, but you know, tubing is, it's, uh, you know, the more you stretch it, the more the resistance is, and you got to change bands. And it's a great tool for very low dollars. So I think it's an awesome tool, but I thought, can you improve upon that? And I thought, well, just why not just plain old cable and a weight stack? So I just built kind of a, rudimentary XY thing that you could adjust pulleys all over and I stuck a bench in front of it and in like a day I figured, you know, hell we can make a chest press and a shoulder <laughs> and this and that and this and that and I thought, you know, it's pretty easy to pull a cable or a rope but it's hard to push. You know, when you pull, you can pull pretty effectively. When you push, you know, you've got all these things to control. But I thought in, in real life we're not just pushing, you know, one fixed path. We're pushing in multiple planes. I can push here or here or here or here. You know, these are all pushing, these are pulling. You know, there's only so many basic human movement patterns and you know, you got pushes and pulls and twists and bends and lunge and squats and so on. <clears throat> so I thought there's, so I thought there's something there and I thought, hell, I'm just gonna start a business again. And uh, at the time I had a, just enough money just to kind of start, start a business and uh, so we did, and I think we started in like March of 2000, and by Thanksgiving, we were shipping 13-piece lines. We moved fast. And the reason we moved fast is because everything isn't done by committee, you know? <laughs> I just go back and make one, say we do it. I, okay, I said I'm the, right guy to start a company, but the wrong guy to run it. But the, the reason I'm a, I was good at starting one is I knew where to get the right sales guys. I knew where the, who good engineers were. I knew who good you know, uh, shipping people were. I, I knew I needed a CFO that knew his way around. I knew that I needed a business manager. So, you know. You're just great at putting teams together by the sound of things. Well, <laughs> if, it, if it takes 10 people, I'm real good at one, I'm okay at one, and I just suck at eight. But I know where to get those eight, and that's what the key was. So we were, we were doing great. I think the first 12 months of shipping, we sold about $10 million worth of stuff. So we were doing good. But it was just funded by myself. And so right at the start, when I came up with the idea, I went to all the local banks in Colorado Springs. Everybody's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But every time I'd meet, they'd put another roadblock in. You know, a lot of people badmouth lawyers. Well, to me, bankers were the <laughs> scourge. You know, they were just they were as far from an entrepreneurial mindset as you could get. And, and finally, I, I just couldn't fund it myself any longer. I just burned through all my money and this and that. I, Where were you manufacturing? 
um, there was a guy in Colorado Springs who uh, was making product for us. We would, he was a manufacturer of steel goods. All right. And so we were buying stuff from him. We had our own assembly and uh, we were shipping product out of Colorado Springs. So what's, what's, what was the sort of, um, what, what, what constrained the business? Was it just cash flow? Yeah, or, right. it, was, it was really just cash flow. Yeah. I had completely tapped out of money. Yeah. You know, you, if you start in March and you're shipping in November 13 pieces and I'd already hired a sales force and all this stuff, you burn through money real fast. Mm. And you know, at that time, we weren't getting paid for 30 days or 60 days or, you know, who knows when you're going to get it. And we, we just needed money. And I took on one investor who turned out to be one of my critical mistakes that I, that I made. But it, it finally got to the point where we just needed cash to get going. And uh, we asked around and we had a few interested people. And... It turned out that uh, Icon, you know, folks in Logan, Utah, ended up purchasing the company. Outright, did they? Yes. Right. Yep. The name was Ground Zero, and the reason was we want to start from Ground Zero. <laughs> what, our, our story was we're, we're not selling equipment. We're, we're, we're selling a story. We're kind of doing missionary selling. And the story was our bodies move in an infinite number of movements and patterns and why not train for real life you know you bend and you twist and you do movement patterns in conjunction you can twist and bend and pull and you can do all of these things and you know when in real life are you fixed stabilized and isolated and the answer is you're not I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that it's awesome for hypertrophy and you know this we're just selling another tool in the toolbox the toolbox is full of stuff that I love. Suspension training, kettlebells, dumbbells, all stuff. We were just training another, selling another tool. We came up with the cable cross with the arms that moved, and I thought that was a pretty cool piece. And was, so it was a connection between the Cybex one, which came, because the Cybex kind of, they had a really nice cross. That was all ours. That was, okay, so, yeah. so the... Uh, Everybody copied ours. So the, the, the um, Ground Zero was kind of an evolution of what was on Cybex, or no, the, Cybex the, took... That yes. idea. Okay. The free motion ground zero was the first cable cross that was a single with, tower with the, with the arms that articulated okay. in it. Interesting. Out. Yeah, we did that one in 2000 or 2000. Yeah, 2000. That was a nice piece. Very nice piece. You still see a lot of them today that are 13 years old and work as good as when they're, you know, sold. Yeah. So, uh, Icon purchased us and. Um, their goal was to, in five years, they were hugely successful in the consumer business. You know, they owned the Weeder brand and Weslow and Nordic Track and all these brands. Huge Reebok as well at the time, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. They're hugely successful. So they thought that within five years, they could overtake life fitness. That was kind of their goal. And I think it was predicated on they thought they could innovate faster. They could had better purchasing power and they had just had all the infrastructure in place. So they had very lofty goals. And at that time, they were just starting to release some commercial grade cardio products, uh, some treadmills, the incline trainer, and a few others. So they wanted to be kind of a f all encompassing supplier. And very shortly after the acquisition, they wanted us to, to design a line of fixed, stabilized, isolated machines. I kind of fought against that. I said it kind of diluted our message, but I lost that battle. And uh, I was only there for about another year or two. So what, because that, um, I, I suppose that was, that, that was totally new to the whole industry. I remember going to Ursa, seeing it, and seeing the trainers with it, and it was, everyone was like, this is the next thing. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you think kind of, because it, it, it kind of had this mini explosion, but it didn't seem to kind of continue to run as you would expect it. Was it because a lot of people saw that and there was just all these imitations very quickly and they weren't able to capitalize on it? Or do you think they didn't have the focus to... Because it, 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 it really, from where I stand, it, it was the first sort of company that even were using, and I may be wrong, but functional training in the industry. You know, they almost, I, I felt they kicked that off with machines. And... Um, 
it was just, it, it, there was almost just, it just didn't seem to take off as I, I thought it would do. Well, uh, your assessment is totally correct, and that's one reason why I left the company. Um, functional training was a buzzword, and everybody's got their own definition of it. But at that time, uh, you know, there was a lot of trainers that were, you know, Paul Chuck and, uh, you know, Juan Carlos, and there, there, was, there was a number of them, and I thought we were kind of on uh, the cusp of something pretty cool here. Um, but when Icon purchased us, uh, the message of what, who we are and what we do was diluted. They pushed us really, really hard to sell their cardio products, and they pushed, as I mentioned, to make the fixed stabilized isolated machines and a bunch of other stuff. And pretty soon our sales guys just lost their way because they were more or less mandated to sell X number of cardio pieces and so on. And our early, our early cardio pieces had some issues. And um, then I left and a lot of our sales guys left and just kind of lost their way, mm. I think. Yeah, so it sounds like the, they may not have realized what they actually had. Very true. And they, I, I made them a line of a couple other, I made them a couple other products that they weren't sure what to do with. And then I saw one, I'm not going to name the product, but I saw one product that they did commercialize. And I saw the trainer doing some instructional videos. And the trainer just had no clue either. So it was just, okay. at that time, Icon, you know, the cons they were really, really good at identifying what was hot in the consumer marketplace. They had, I believe, around 40% product turnover per year in their uh, home stuff. So they were just churning stuff, just churning stuff all the time. And that was their focus because mm. uh, they were near a billion dollars yeah. of selling that stuff. So, you know, this little strength division and selling commercial cardio you know, they didn't get a lot of focus or attention. Right. And rightly so, you know, they're, they've got this gigantic company that's cruising along. And I think they underestimated the difference between selling consumer product and commercial product. It just couldn't be more different. Mm. And I, I think they just misjudged that. Mm. What, what about, tell me about the design, because I think um, I, I lo love design and, and you know I think there's some people who do a really nice job of design but not necessarily quality or biomechanics and then you, you have great people that have that but don't have the design and, I, and one of the things I noticed probably when it when it was ground zero first because that's when I saw it before the name change and I want to ask you about that as well but um, what what where did the design inspiration come? Because it was very, it, it was very unique. There was nothing mm -hmm. like it in yep. the industry, you know, and it almost kind of, you know, with the, the zero and the, the angles and yeah, everything. Kind of monolithic. It, it really had a, yeah. you know, it was, it, was, it was very, very interesting. And I think even, I, I may be wrong, but I thought there was, a, there was some benches and that that went with it yeah. as well, that I just thought they were the, I'm probably just geeky and no, but I just remember those were cool benches. They were real thick, fat steel and yeah. had these really nice they stainless were. steel parts on yeah. them. Um, so tell me a little bit about the design ethos on, on that. Well, I just wanted to do something that w was different. And, you know, I wanted to, we were coming up with uh, what I thought was kind of a new category. So I thought it needed to look different, smell different, feel different, taste different. And if it was just two inch square tubing like everyone else's, it'd just get lost in the mix. And I, I like that structural element of, you know, just kind of a, a, a monolithic tower that's tapered and, and I like the angles and so on. And I just thought that it was a kind of pretty design. And, and I, again, I'm not an engineer. I'm not even a college graduate. I, you know, I, I'm not an engineer certainly. So I would, I just make sketches and a napkin sketch and I just thought this kind of looked cool. And it was just really that simple. But, I've always, like you, uh, I just look at stuff. I, the first thing I did when I came in here, I just looked at the shapes. And I'm, you know, kind of an architecture science museum geek. And, you know, I just, I, I just appreciate that. And, uh, you know, some companies like Technogym, beautiful equipment. And 
there's a reason that it is. You know, they bring people down from Milan, Pininfarina, and you know these design studios, and it's it's elegant. It's mm. Italian furniture, and so that is kind of like the top of the level there. Then you have something that's kind of 180 degrees different, and that's the three-inch square, bunch of holes painted black, generic crap that you know every <laughs> power rack looks like. Mm. And so, you know, you got to find and figure out where you want to be in that mix. But I prefer to have something that there's a real value and a perceived value. And I believe you should have both. Yeah. You know, you, you really need to have value. There needs to be substance, something substantive there. And, I, and, and, you know, if it costs you 1% more to make it look elegant, that's money well spent. Mm. And I think the customer will pay a lot more than 1% for something that's elegant and unique. So with, with the name change, was that, was that when the Twin Towers happened? Yeah, Did absolutely. you think that affected? The, the... 100%. Yeah. And when it happened, my first initial thought was, you know, it obviously was just a horrible, horrible disaster. And within two, three days, they started referring to the site as Ground Zero, almost within a day or two. And I thought, this is, this is really this is really bad. And so I said to the folks in uh, Utah, I said, we, we got to change our name. We need to be proactive with this. And they were a little resistant. And I think it was maybe like a week later, there was an article in USA Today, which everybody read at the time. And one of the, the one of the, so the big articles, almost like a full page, they took a survey and there was about 40, 50 companies across the US that were named Ground Zero. And they were inter, they were, talking to a bunch of them, seeing if they were going to change their name. And the worst example, or the worst, worst isn't the right word, but the, the, the group that was impacted the most was in New York City, there was actually an advertising agency called Ground Zero, and their logo was like a mushroom cloud. And so I'm guessing virtually everybody that was named Ground Zero just respectfully, uh, wisely chose to change their name. And we became free motion fitness because our first basic machines were called free motion. I, I just thought that was a good name and we just decided to go with that. Mm. So where did you go from there? Because I lost, uh, the, the next part I could track you on was, was Aleka. Was that, was that the next move or was there something in between there? Well, I left um, free motion in 2004, maybe something like that. Just stuck around a year or two after the acquisition. Um, they wanted to be the president or CEO or something, and I wasn't suited for that. And I, I was just struggling, trying to. I, I didn't feel good about doing what they were asking me to do, so I just decided to leave. <clears throat> so um, I was in. Uh, I decided that I'd try doing some things on my own. And I built a bunch of prototypes, a lot of prototypes. And I showed them to various people around the industry and I just flat on my face. No one was interested. Showed Precore, showed Cybex guys, just, just kind of went flat. I think it was like 2008. So it was like maybe three, four years, just got no traction. Uh, Cybex and a friend, a friend of mine contacted Cybex. Cybex wanted me to do a few free weight pieces. I did a few free weight pieces and we were right on the cusp of going to do more. And that's when the stock market thing kind of crapped out and they said, listen, we just, we're just going to scale back. And so commercial fitness business was kind of in the tank, you know, at that point. So maybe like 2010 when things were getting a little better, I built a bunch more prototypes, showed them to a bunch of people. No one, were, no one was the least bit interested. Um, I did a little project for American Barbell. They never commercialized that because they were doing some other things. Um, did, a little, did a couple pieces for, uh, for Precor. Uh, they wanted a few things done. I did a couple pieces for them. Uh, I knew a bunch of the sales guys, Chuck Fedorka, Jimmy Levine. There was a bunch of you know, good guys, really good guys working. And I've always had a prototype shop. I, I, I just go back and make stuff. Um, I, don't, I might make a little napkin sketch, but I just go back and make stuff. So I've always had a shop with stuff around. And the Precore guy said, you know, why, don't, why can't we show this to the, the bigwigs? You know? And uh, so we finally scheduled a meeting. 
And we sh I shipped up eight, nine, or 10 pieces, and Jimmy and Chuck and those guys were there. Well, who, who evaluated those pieces at Precor was uh, the, eight, the head of HR and uh, the CFO, and there was a management team of like six or eight. I think one person may have been in a gym once, and they just looked at it like, you know, I'd grown another head. They had no idea what I was showing them. I showed them some, uh, well, one of the things I showed them was, uh, I called it Michael Citrone, and I got a busted Woodway treadmill, and I took all the guts out of it, but kept the track, and I put an eddy current braking system into it, and in essence, I, I made like what I thought was a, it's today kind of called a push mill, you know, a self-powered tr treadmill. And I said, you know, we can control the resistance and you can just walk on it or you can lean into it and really grind away. And the people at Precor, they thought that was the stupidest thing they'd ever seen. It's like, what the hell? Where's the motor? What they, year was that? 2010? Yeah, 10 or 11. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that would have been before the assault yeah. that came yeah. along. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I had different resistance systems. I had pneumatic. I had hydraulic. I had... Um, some cable things. I just I made like eight different categories of stuff. They just had no interest. So, so I just kind of dicked around in my shop for a couple of years. Made some hot rods. You know, <laughs> goofed around and <laughs> built stuff. My son works with me, so we were futzing around a lot. And then, 13, 14, something like that. Hillis called me up and said he was interviewing with the Aleco guys. I said, oh, that's an awesome company. Aleco distributed some of our uh, yeah, that's free right, motion, free motion and, yeah. yeah, I remember, yeah. And back in the early 70s, Aleco used to advertise in the little ad about this big in the back of Iron Man magazines, which I'd kind of scour through and look at and everything. And the Aleco, oh, that's a magical name, I thought, in the 70s. And so then they distributed our stuff in the early 2000s. And, Family run business, awesome family, just the nicest people. And so Hillis took the job with uh, Laco, and then I contacted him and I said, you know, would you be interested in some kind of unique stuff that I got? And they said, sure. So I met Eric and Ricard Blomberg and struck a deal. And so I was going to build some of the stuff in my shop in Colorado Springs and went over to Sweden and looked around and fell in love with that. And so I said, tell you what, why don't I just come to Sweden for a while and do stuff here? And they said, great. So I got there. I loved everything about it. And uh, I have a Swedish grandmother, and you know, I'm from Minnesota. And you know, this was all familiar to me. <laughs> and the people were super nice. And, but when I got there, I realized that what I was going to do for them was some unique products. But when I got there, I realized that much like when I went back to Cybex in their 90s, that a lot of their products were kind of long in the tooth, kind of, so to speak. And I said, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but I said, I'd love to work on some of your existing products before worked on the stuff that I was going to work on. And they said, sure. And so I said, well, they were making some dumbbells at the time that were kind of rough, and they were kind of some generic ones. I said, you know, you're known for your bars and the, the, the steel and the knurling and, you know, the spin on your bars. I said, let's make two types of dumbbells. Let's make these dumbbells that revolve and let's make a set of fixed and let's make them with all these features. And, you know, so I did all their dumbbells and they it, were going to introduce this weightlifting platform that you could drop the weights on. Well, they... This was so different than a true weightlifting. You know, their history is weightlifting, and no one does it better than no. them. I mean, they are runaway the leader. They, they're the guys. But that's a whole different animal than people in a gym and dropping it on the second floor, mm -hmm. you know, when the yoga studio is below. So they had what they thought was a, a platform that you could drop weights on. So they sent one to us, and we installed it at a local Lifetime Fitness my son and I did. And the first time we dropped the weights, the bar bounced up, right up, backed up to our face. And down below, it sounded like cannons were going off. So we realized that this is a different animal. So it's way, way, way harder. It, it, you're, you're asking it to do three things that aren't necessarily compatible. One is you're, you want it to absorb sound. You want it to absorb the vibration, you know, the 
you know, the resonance that it transfers, and you want to minimize the bounce and the rebound. Well, those three don't like to play very well with one another, so it was much, much, much harder. And to Aleko's credit, they were willing to, to test and test and test and test, but it took a long time, and we had to retrofit a bunch because they had promised a lot of ones that weren't up to standard, and Hillis was having to, you know, spend a lot of time pacifying customers, but we finally made a, a pretty darn, darn good one. So did that, did, uh, redid all of their weightlifting competition stuff, you know. Did the, you do the, I heard you did the deadlift bar as well. Yeah, I did that, just a bunch of stuff. And everybody thinks that stuff is so hard, it's so easy. That was like two hours. I mean, you, <laughs> you look at the bar and you think, it's a stupid design, you know, and you, how do you, yeah, so it did, did that stuff. So I lived in Sweden for almost a couple of years, and then finally I said, I wanted to do a bunch of stuff that they weren't willing to do, and it was a smart thing that they didn't really want to do it, because they're so entrenched in the world of weightlifting, and, you know, I can't tell you, I know the number, I, I shouldn't tell you how many bars they this, they sell, they, they do a fabulous job. And I wanted to make some really unique and unique and revolutionary and kind of create some new stuff and they weren't really interested, which is a good business decision from them, but it was kind of left me kind of like back where I was at Cybex in the 80s where I wanted to do something, but you know, they were good with what they had. And all the stuff I originally wanted to do, they said, you know, you know, they're kind of so tied into that world of weightlifting, and if you're going to squat, it's got to be with a bar. You can't, you know, that's the only pure way of squatting. And I said, well, that's just one of many ways of hip extension, knee extension combined in one exercise. So I just said, you know, I, I'm great terms. I, I think I'm just going to go do something on my own again. And, you know, at the last URSA, I ended up spending more time in their booth than anybody else, and that's who <laughs> I go out to dinner with. But, you know, just had a friendly partying, and... You know, since then, I just did a little stint on something for some folks in Taiwan, but I just keep making stuff in my shop, <laughs> hoping someday someone will want to commercialize it. So where do you see, like, you, you, you obviously spend a lot of time thinking about ideas, and you're clearly in touch with the industry. Like, how would you, I think it's changed since the pandemic. I think there's different things that people are asking about in uh -huh. gym, different people are going in there. Like, how would, how would you now describe where we are today and what are some of the trends that you're thinking about? Not necessarily related to a product, but, but how would you best describe where we are today in relation to sort of where, you know, some of those key markers in, in your history? Well, there's obviously way more women than there, there ever has been in the past. And I think uh, with social media, for women, you know, the focus is on, you know, abdominal, glutes, but, you know, but training than that, and uh, um, I, I think that people are understanding that the really important muscles are kind of from your ribs to your knees. You know, the, these t-shirt muscles are, are nice and, and so on, but that doesn't necessarily help you live a longer, healthier, productive life. And uh, so I think there's, uh, it depends on what gym you go in. Like, uh, a gym that I go to oftentimes, I still see a 10 to 1 ratio of upper body training to lower body, body training. Mm. What, this, for men or women? Uh, for men. For men, yeah. Yep. yeah. I would agree. Yep. And so I think that's going to change slowly. But, you know, guy's ego is always going to, that's never going to change. <laughs> so it's chest and biceps, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What looks good in the, in the mirror on the T-shirt. Um, but I think... Uh, I. I I, I think what, whatever def definition you want to use of functional training is, is growing. I think obviously the cardio areas are shrinking drastically, drastically. I think those so-called functional areas, the turf areas and so on, I think that's awesome. I think there is more innovation in that area by far, by far, by quantum leaps than there is in the traditional strength area. The traditional strength area is pretty much unchanged for decades, but I think, you know, and there's been some kind of ups and downs, you know, suspension training kind of had its peak and, you know, that's kind of declined and so on. But, you know, people pushing, pulling, twisting, lunging, doing things with the apparatus in the turf area, I think that's awesome. Um, I think we're getting people outside more. I think that's a mm -hmm. good thing. 
especially where we live, there's no excuse why not to. Um, I think, um, I just, I, I just hope for more education so more people get more benefit, less injuries, get more long-term benefit. Um, people, I, I get a lot of questions from friends to saying, well, you know, what's better, a, a, a treadmill or a bike? And I said, whichever of the two you like better, and that's just two of 10. Mm -hmm. And someone will say to me, well, you know, what about, you know, the Mike Menser, Casey Yater, Doreen Yates, high intensity training? I said, well, personally, I like it a lot, but I said, you got to mix it up with other stuff. You can't do that to the exclusion of everything else. They say, well, what about, you know, the kind of high repetition stuff? I said, there's a place for that too. They, they, they said, these are just all tools and methodologies. You got to, you need to find out what works for you. And most importantly, you got to find out what you can stick with and you can enjoy. Hmm. You know, uh, you know, not everybody's got the genetics or the mental toughness or drive of Dorian Yates. You know, that, you know, there's a reason why he's Mr. Olympia. <laughs> and, you know, the average Joel can do that for a while, but I don't know that you can train like that when you're 70 years old. And Dorian doesn't. I mean, Dorian is trimmed down. He rides his bicycle. Mm -hmm. he's a, he practices yoga. He's a, he's a cool dude. And uh, so I, I, think it's, I think it's evolving. Where it's really going to go, I have no idea. But I just like to see more, for what I do, provide strength training tools. I just think there's a lot more tools that can be built. I think there's a lot of things that are, are safer, more comfortable, better use of space. I see a lot of gyms that have rack, 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 rack. <clears throat> they usually have a waiting line. They're very inefficient, use, a hugely inefficient use of space. People tend to camp out in them. Yeah. They're awesome for a college or university where you got 50 of them and you know, the strength coach programs what two guys are going to do and they ne ne never leave that area. But, you know, in a... In a fitness facility, it's very inefficient use of space. Um, People do camp out. I was in the Gold's Gym of Increase Says. I think they've got like 30. Yeah. And you, you, uh, you, know, you, you see some of the girls, and they're literally, they've got a plier box at the end. Yeah. They've got their phone, their bags, their cameras, because they're filming, yeah. obviously, now. And they're exactly. there for an hour on a squat rack. And obviously, you, unless you've got a ton of space. Like, those gyms are big, and you could probably put it in. But most gyms can't move the traffic through <laughs> no and it's extraordinarily frustrating for everybody that's in there and so I, I the squat racks and that they're super versatile you can do a lot of stuff in them but are they good use of space no could there would there be a better way to perform squats deadlifts olympic lifts whatever other things you want to do in that area and the answer is yes besides just going to a bar or a set of dumbbells or it's other or is there apparatus with, that you could use with a bar and a dumbbell that's a different type of apparatus? Mm. And I think all those things are just wide open. Mm. You know, and it just takes someone to be the first. You know, as a cyclist, I, to this day, it just amazes me that, you know, for the first hundred years of cycling and with two-wheeled bicycles until, you know, these crazy guys in Marin County started making mountain bicycles that you could only ride a bicycle on paved roads. You know, now you can mountain bike. Well, a few years ago, everybody realized, well, there's a lot of roads that are gravel. You can gravel ride. Well, someone's got to be the first, and someone's got to solve the popularize problem. it and solve the problem. <laughs> What's your favorite piece of equipment that you've designed? Um, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I think the cable cross is pretty nice because it kind of ushered in an era of thinking a, a different way of training. I think all of the Cybex VR2 stuff, I think there were some unique features there and you know, it fit a wider range of people and it was smooth and quiet and this and that. But that was a, kind of an incremental. And the cable cross machine, that was not new by any means. I mean, I've seen pictures of on the Titanic, they had some cable <laughs> machines. So there's nothing new there. But we kind of made it uh, more approachable, and it's become kind of a staple. I don't think you can really open a gym without having some company's version of a cable cross. Mm. I mean, everybody's got at least a few of them. So I thought that was kind of a cool thing to be mm. part of. Is there anything that you've seen that you haven't invented that you respect from 
someone else or some other brand. Oh, yeah, lots and lots of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. I mean, just suspension training, I mean, that's, it's, it's another great tool. I mean, it's something you can carry in a handbag, that's pretty cool. Um, the adjustable dumbbells, that's freaking awesome. I mean, I used to have a set of dumbbells all over my garage. and the, I, I've had a set of Intel bells I bought from Carl 25 years ago. I, I still have them in my garage today. I think that's an awesome tool. Um, Is that what they used to be called before power block, Intel bells, were they? Yeah, they were original Intel bells and then power block. I think those are great tools. Um, I think the tank is cool, mm -hmm. that push sled. I think yours, putting the front wheel on it so that you know, you're not digging into the ground, I think that's cool. There's just lots of these little things that the ball keeps moving forward. I mean, I didn't think of the tank, I didn't think of putting the front wheel on it. Oh, that's Pete Holman, actually. He, was, uh, we well, part, he was, uh, came to us with that idea, but. Yeah. So look, we've gone for a while, um, and it's been very interesting for any, for any of the sort of equipment geeks out there. It's, uh, <laughs> An interesting uh, view on the history of the fitness industry, that's for sure. But I've got one more question that we, sure. we like to ask at the end. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is possible and gone on to make possible. Mm -hmm. What would be a memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? Well, that's, man, that's, a, that's, an, awesome, that's an awesome question. I guess, I guess I've kind of had a philosophy that, that kind of matches up with yours in that I'd rather, I'd rather try 10 times to do something and fail nine, but knowing that there's a 10th where I'm gonna be able to pull it off. Never afraid of failure, because everybody fails, and I think a lot of times you, I mean, the first face mask I made was horrible, <laughs> you know, but I eventually figured out how to do it, and the first weight machine kind of sucked, and you know, I first started bicycle racing, that was not very good, and I got to be pretty okay with that, and, I just think people shouldn't be ever afraid to try something new. I just never wanted to be one of those old guys on their deathbed who just said, oh, I wish I had tried this or I wish I had tried that. You know, just what's the worst going to happen? You just start over. So I, I, I don't know. I just I, I, I liked making all the things that I've made over the years. I felt good doing it, and I think a lot of those tools and products provided entertainment and fun and happiness and help people stay healthy and fit. So gave a lot of jobs to people. A lot of people, I think, uh, whatever their goal was, made it in some way, got them a little closer to that goal. So I guess that's my answer. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good one, but that's all I can think of. Well, boy, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you. that. I appreciate thank it you. too. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've got any value from it, whatsoever, then please do us a favor, like, subscribe, tell somebody, and that will help us to be able to continue to do more of these and help you escape your own personal limits. Thanks for listening.